Uh, I think we can uh, start. Um, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, new uh, Fujita Health University Alumni Association webinar. Uh, I want to uh, say hello, of course, uh, first of all to uh, Professor Yoko Kato, our uh, mentor, uh, and also to Professor Ishu Bishnoi, my co-moderator today, as uh, usually happens, uh, and also uh, welcome to uh, Raja and uh, Liu, uh, who are very important pillars of the organization of these webinars uh, uh, all the time. Uh, today, we have the great pleasure uh, to have two great speakers. Uh, both of them will talk about uh, uh, very interesting topics, I think, especially for uh, uh, young neurosurgeons. Uh, Professor Hirofumi Nakatomi and Dr. Heba Azuz. So welcome to both uh, our speakers. So uh, before uh, I introduce Professor Nakatomi, maybe Professor Yoko Kato, do you want to uh, say some introductory uh, no. word? Already I talked to the, some few words. So uh, thank, thank you very much, Nakatomi Sensei. So yes. even a very hectic time. So Professor Nakatomi, uh, he became a chairman of the Kyorin University uh, since it's a, a Maybe a few months back, or lots, lots of few months. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He was uh, really uh, clever. Uh, I admire him very much because uh, then uh, Tokyo University, because he graduated Tokyo University, and the Tokyo University had a Japanese Congress, maybe uh, maybe the several years back. So at the time, his general secretary was Nakatomi Sensei. Yes. He planned everything. So I was so impressed his work. So since that time, I, I really admire your work. I focus on your work. So I thank you very much for your uh, attending and also the support uh, webinar. And Heba Sensei, konbanwa. Uh, Heba Sensei, <laughs> she's, one of, I, she's one of the strongest the female neuroscientist. He's, she's from Cairo. And I think that he, she is very promising it's because every, every African professor is uh, uh, how do I say? Uh, you are very uh, expecting the neurosurgeon, you know, in the near future. I got the designers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> your presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, sorry, thank you. Hi, Albert, thank you. Thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu, Professor. Uh, and um, so we can start with our first speaker, Professor Hirofumi Nakatomi. Uh, he uh, graduated uh, from the University of Tokyo a School of Medicine, and then uh, he uh, completed his residency at the same university. Uh, he uh, has had the possibility to uh, have some fellowships abroad, uh, especially in the United States, uh, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, at the University of Cincinnati and House Clinic, uh, focusing especially on skull-based surgery. Uh, he then became a, a first assistant professor at the University of Tokyo, uh, and then uh, chief of neurosurgery at uh, Tora Nomon uh, Hospital. Uh, he uh, then became associate professor uh, at the University of Tokyo uh, Hospital. And uh, as Professor Yoko Kato uh, said, he uh, is right now Professor uh, of Neurosurgery uh, at the Kirin University School of Medicine. Uh, he published uh, a number of papers in internationally uh, peer-reviewed journals, uh, and we are all very uh, interested in uh, uh, hearing his talk today. Uh, his talk will be about uh, microanatomy and microanastomosis cadaver training course surgical techniques for bypass standard procedure, pitfall, and how to train your skills. So I think a very, very important lecture, especially for young neurosurgeons. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nakatomi, for joining. And please, uh, you can start sharing your screen. OK, uh, thank you very much for uh, everyone. And uh, Professor, uh, I really uh, appreciate Professor Cattle's uh, invitation and also your, your organization. And uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, the uh, basic 
principles of the microanatomy and the microanastomosis. Let me share the slides. Can you see okay? Yes, everything looks perfect. So actually, I uh, I talked uh, two two months ago about this uh, course, but uh, let me repeat the most important uh, point. Uh, my university has the huge anatomic lab. Actually, we can take care uh, at least forty members at one seminar uh, through the uh, ten to 20 cadaveric uh, specimens. So uh, I thought it would be very best to use this cadaver uh, di dissection as a tool to uh, educate uh, particularly microanastomosis or skull-based trainings. Because uh, we think now uh, we are moving towards the era of the uh, very difficult uh, era. Uh, most of the aneurysms or most of the stenotic region of the vascular disease has been now treated with uh, interventional radiology technique. Then uh, how can we survive in this era? Uh, I thought uh, we needed to use a variety of bypass techniques and you need to be familiar with the basics and the pitfall of these bypass, at least ECRA M2 bypass, A3 A3 bypass, uh, V3 RA PCA bypass, so that you can take care of every difficult aneurysms, even they are big or they are a giant. Also, sometimes if you do the ICIC bypass, you need to do the continuous anastomosis. Uh, we can learn from the famous cardiac surgeon. And ultimately, after 100 or 200 uh, cerebrovascular, uh, experience, cerebrovascular uh, anastomosis experience, we have got a lot of the troubleshoot uh, lessons. So I'd like to share with you. Uh, but we only have 30 minutes. We might uh, stop in the middle, but the next time I will continue, okay? So Please we- take, take your time, Professor, take your time. Okay. Then uh, let me uh, review uh, four basics of microanastomosis. Number one, you need to stitch the endothelial uh, surface of the recipient and the donor. Uh, together like this, and uh, in the averting fashion. Uh, this is the inside. Uh, the left side should be the outside. You need to uh, do the anastomosis in averting fashion. Cutting the donor uh, vessel at 60 degree and making an additional incision in the lumen to further widen the anastomotic caliber. The basic principle number two, uh, if the thickness of the vessel wall, we can define as T millimeter, T millimeter, the needle entry point should be 2T millimeter from the end, from the end. Also, we can anastomosis uh, in, uh, with the interval of 4T. There is some calculation, but we can just uh, remember T, 2T, 4T, uh, rule of thumb. And uh, microanastomosis basics number three, uh, if the donor transaction is incised in this uh, fisherman's manner, uh, the area of the anastomosis is 3.6 times larger than that of the initial area of the uh, trans vascular transection. So uh, this is uh, very useful to expand the anastomotic window. Then ultimately, the basics number four is uh, after placing the uh, stay suture in the toe side, as well as on the uh, 
heel side. Uh, you can apply one stitch just beside the pole, then move on to the uh, second stitch uh, just beside the heel and so forth, alternating toes and the heels. Uh, then you can repeat. Or you can simply apply in sequential uh, stitches from the toe to heel. Uh, for the beginners, I think we can try the alternating stitches so that you can avoid the most difficult stitches at the heel side. Is anybody have the questions or uh, unknown or uh, very difficult to understand? Just ask. We can uh, explain more. How about these four principles? Are we okay? Yes, Professor, I think so. And we have discussion at the end in any case. Okay. Then uh, the, the most important uh, lesson I am now running uh, while uh, educating the younger neurosurgeon, because they are, are pursuing uh, two-way surgeon, like uh, uh, they do uh, endovascular, or they do some uh, brain tumor, or they do some endoscope. There are so many uh, candidates or possibilities for all of you. And uh, sometimes uh, the skull base techniques should be the last, often be the last to learn for some reason, I don't know. But I would uh, like to emphasize the skull base uh, dissection technique is the best friend for the cerebrovascular surgery. Because, uh, you know, for example, we are looking at the frontotemporal area of the uh, right side uh, air, right, right head. Then you see the skull has been elevated and uh, the superficial uh, temporal fascia has been elevated from the root of the zygoma you see the temporal muscle like this. But often, I, I thought often many of you wouldn't see this type of the two layer uh, muscle dissection. If you are familiar with this type of two layer dissection, you can create more and more wider and more deeper space uh, along the uh, periorbital area as well as to the anterior temporal areas. Let's uh, look at uh, in detail. Uh, for the front temporal area, bony landmark should be the here, orbital zygomatic suture. Whenever you do the uh, front temporal scalp elevation, you should see the front orbital zygomatic suture. If you can easily see the uh, front orbital zygomatic suture here, that should be enough for uh, one layer uh, uh, front temporal craniotomy. But now you are planning to uh, dissect in two layer fashion, you need to see, you need to further dissect from the uh, front to the paraorbital bone then uh, go into the zygomatic coach. For the root of zygoma, you can uh, first identify just in front of the superior temporal artery. Once you find the root of zygoma, you can lift up the superficial muscle uh, fa temporal fascia uh, with a uh, uh, blunt tool, then uh, uh, for the superficial temporal muscle fascia, I am, uh, if you see the, this, this large uh, temporal muscle, I would say uh, just in the middle, you can design the uh, superficial muscle uh, dissecting incision like this way. This half incision will help you to preserve any uh, facial nerve injury because facial nerve always pass two centimeter front to the root of zygoma. So facial nerve always passing this area. Then uh, once you can make the uh, half uh, area of the, half the superficial temporal fat protection 
to the facial nerve, you shouldn't be encounter any uh, of the facial nerve paralysis. Actually, this is a view after dissecting the superficial temporal fascia uh, inside in the middle of the temporal muscle. After identifying the uh, root of zygoma here, uh, orbital zygomatic suture here, uh, zygomatic root, and you will see the supraorbital nerve. So, so those four points are the key landmark. So now you see the uh, periorbital areas and the supraorbital nerve, and the zygomatic arch has been cut at the bottom of the root of zygoma. Then a routine uh, frontotemporal uh, craniotomy has been done after drilling the perioneal areas. Uh, by doing the drilling uh, of the key perioneal area, you will see the uh, su superior orbital fissure connection and inferior orbital fissure connection to the uh, uh, drilled areas. Then uh, we can go, the, go deeper. Once the, these uh, frontotemporal uh, FTOZ uh, craniotomy has been done, we can see the paraorbital, if you can do it, if you can skeletonize the orbital area fully, you will see a lot of the space in front of the uh, frontal lobe as well as temporal lobe. And again, if you can keep drilling, continue to the uh, sphenoid ridge until you see the meaning orbital band, then you can go further drill the uh, anterior part of the uh, temporal middle fossa bone, then you will see the cavernous sinus. Now we are reaching to the edge of the cavernous sinus. Uh, once you uh, accomplish this, uh, type of this uh, type of the window, you can easily take out the anterior crinoid process. So once uh, anterior crinoid has been removed, you can do everything. You can go into the cavernous sinus, or you can see the V1 or V1, V2, and V3 areas. You can go into the anterior cavernous sinus too. I forgot to explain, uh, just uh, before doing the anterior craniotomy, you can take out the, at least eight millimeter of the main orbital band, because this is a band between the periorbital, temporal tip dura, and the front, frontal base dura. This is a junction of the three orbital and the temporal tip and the frontal base. Once you cut the meaning orbital band, eight millimeter max, you will see a huge uh, expansion of the surgical corridor here. So I think this is uh, today. This is the most important message uh, for the even for the frontotemporal uh, craniotomy. You you should be uh, familiar with uh, this anterior craniotomy of a partial cavernous sinus dissection so that you are you should be more and more uh, comfortable to do the paracarotid aneurysms. Then we can go, uh, go to the real uh, operations. We got this type of the uh, near giant aneurysm at the paracrinoid areas and the female uh, came with a visual loss. And we did the ICA balloon occlusion test at the uh, C5 segment. She couldn't tolerate well. So what's the plan? Uh, our plan is we should uh, construct the ECA to M2 RA bypass uh, by with the supporting STMCA to the M4 areas. Then uh, after that, we can simply ligate the ICA at the neck. So let me uh, introduce, this is a 3D uh, surgical simulation. Uh, we developed 
uh, to the uh, previous university. But now this uh, 3D surgical, 3D neurosurgical simulator has been uh, uh, commercially available. Uh, it's a little bit expensive, but uh, you can use uh, the same uh, tool uh, for your practice. Then uh, we can uh, combine any CTA or angiogram or uh, MRI all in one image. After combining all the images, we see her uh, optic nerve on the right side has been pushed upward and medially by the aneurysm. So uh, at least we thought we needed to decompress the optic fifth before manipulating the aneurysm. Now we are approaching to the STA with uh, traction. Then after completing the craniotomy, we use the uh, uh, pneumoflux 24 gauge uh, catheter from the uh, cranial side to the next side. Now we are uh, looking at the dissecting the uh, through the transylvian approach. And we saw her M2 inferior trunk should be the candidate for the RA graft. Now, uh, in order to support the occlusion time of the uh, inferior trunk, we put the STMCA first to the M4, uh, connecting to the inferior trunk of the M2 segment. Then uh, since the ST has uh, two branches, the other uh, frontal branch has been used for the continuous uh, uh, measurement of the uh, brain surface circulating pressure. Uh, for myself, I use this type of the uh, very weak curved serrated uh, uh, forceps. I don't use a uh, uh, needle holder. You can purchase this type of the selected uh, uh, instrument from the Fujita Medical Instrument Company. So let me uh, go back. The important point for the, this type of the big bypass, you need to create at least a 4.5 millimeter big uh, anastomotic window. Then after placing the uh, toe side and heel side uh, stay suture, the most important thing is you shouldn't uh, catch the opposite wall. So in order to avoid the opposite wall uh, suturing, I put uh, even, I start from the left side, I put the uh, one middle stitch in, in the middle uh, to avoid the, uh, opposite suturing uh, uh, to the beginning. Let's say after completing the two stitches for the stay suture, I put the one additional stitches on the right side uh, to approximate the uh, recipient and the donor uh, in order to prevent the uh, opposite side uh, suturing. Oh, 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 sorry. Are we okay for the RA graft uh, point? Then the next thing, after completing the big bypass, big anastomosis on the M2, we should avoid the blood flow, in blood stream go into the graft. If you got some amount of the blood in the graft, that will lead the graft thrombosis. So you shouldn't uh, get any blood flow, blood inflow into the graft after completing the bypass. That is the second important technique. Then after completing the brain side anastomosis, we go back to the next side. We used the uh, uh, 24 gauge uh, big uh, pneumoflux catheter to uh, secure the uh, 
space. But uh, just before uh, doing the next anastomosis, you have to take out. For the uh, next side anastomosis, we use a seven or, or six or running suture. For the next side uh, bypass anastomosis, the important thing is you need to create a big seven to 10 millimeter hole in the ECA main plug by using the cardiac aortic punch, 4.5 millimeter. You need to remove the part of the external cardiac wall unless these external cardiac wall have the tendency to uh, uh, huge heal by themselves. So you need to take out the part of the, the vessel wall. Then after that, it's very getting very easier to do the anastomosis in learning fashion. Then uh, at the end, uh, we can confirm the backflow from the brain to the neck. Then uh, we can see, we can make sure there is no uh, huge leakage from the next side. That's what we do. Then after completing the radial artery graft construction, we went uh, onto the uh, ICZ video angiography to confirm the flow. Then uh, we simply uh, start the clinoidectomy report. Now we have already taken out the meaning orbital band here. Then you can see the uh, top part, superior part of the crinoid, as well as the lateral part of the crinoid, you can drill in the middle of the crinoid until they get halo. Then uh, at the last, you can easily take out the crinoid with the uh, longio. Let me just go back. After, after making this crinoid halo, you can take out with the longio. Now, anterior crinoid has been all out. So you can incise the carotid cyst as well as the optic cyst here. For uh, dissecting the carotid cape, you, you need to have some courage because uh, often we will encounter the bleeding from the cavernous sinus wall, but it should be uh, easily controllable with the head elevation and some uh, hemostatic material like uh, uh, flow seal or any uh, kind of the, uh, hemostatic materials. Then after completing the bypass, uh, we simply uh, uh, ligated the ICA on the neck and confirmed with the interoperative angiography. Okay. Then for the closure, we need to put some uh, material around the optic cyst or a carotid cyst uh, inside the area to uh, avoid the CSF leak. For this radiality, I would stop here. Then uh, this lady had some trouble afterwards, but uh, she recovered very well. Then uh, we can go to the next. This is the last uh, point. Then uh, uh, let me summarize. For ECA RM2 bypass, base six and the pit hole, open the cerebellum fissure widely and deeply. Uh, pay close attention to the in initial entry and exit points and angles of the stay suture. The needle should be displaced radially, perpendicularly. Support bypass and the surface pressure monitoring are useful. Elevate the body blood pressure by about 20% uh, during the uh, shutdown or clamp period. Prepare intravenous labonal, it's a, labonal is a, a medicine and edalabon uh, is a brain protection in case of unexpected ischemia. I would say uh, 20 to 35 minutes should be safe. 
But、uh, once you got the more than 14 minutes, you should be、uh, careful to avoid any、uh, ischemia、uh, occurrence. The RA and M2 lumens are washed and coated with a 10 times dense uh, uh, concentrated heparin solution. That's what we used.、Uh, and particularly for the ECA lumen,、uh, we used the、uh, no dilated uh, real uh, heparin to、uh, coat the surface of the endothelium of the external carotid artery. Uh, this is the lessons I learned from the Professor Spitzlow. How about the posterior circulation bypass? I, I will uh, uh, go over how to、uh, dissect the occipital artery because、uh, one of the biggest obstacles to do the posterior circulation bypass should be the、uh, difficulty. In the OA preparation, occipital artery preparation should be still difficult for everyone. So, let me、uh, show this、uh, gentleman had the acoustic neuroma here、uh, 20 years ago. Then,、uh, after 20 years,、uh, this guy developed the fusiform ike aneurysm and it's getting larger and larger. What we can do? Looks like this ICA aneurysm has、uh, two branches, surprising,、uh, supplying、uh, many areas of the right side、uh, cerebellum. So、uh, we decided to put the OA ICA bypass and cover two branch territory, then uh, uh, tra trap the aneurysm at the、uh, main trunk of the ICA and、uh, before the branching point here. So, this is a 3D image. You see the tumor, and the tumor is hiding the aneurysm. But、uh, after completing the retrosigmoid approach, you should be able to see two branches of the ICAR, as well as the,、uh, near, near to the main trunk of the facial nerve. You should be able to identify the ICAR main trunk. This is the basic principle for the OA dissection. I start from the top part. You can identify the course of the occipital artery with the Doppler fluorometer. Then uh, you can uh, put the imaginary curved line from the mid midline to the、uh, mastoid tip area, like a C curved area. Then、uh, you should identify the distal edge here. Then、uh, you can chase the uh, uh, stump of the occipital nerve to the central part. Also, at the、uh, cardiac part, you should identify the proximal part at the second. So, find out at the distal end first, then go to the、uh, proximal part at the, under the longissimus muscle. Then、uh, you can simply Uh, connect these two dots into one. That's what、uh, I thought、uh, this is the、uh, most、uh, easiest way to、uh, secure the occipital artery. We are now starting from the midline. Here is a midline area. Then、uh, use the cutting bipolar. You can purchase from the Fujita Medical Instrument Company. Then、uh, now we are、uh, incising the lateral part. Then,、uh, once we dissected the scalp, we can easily identify the sternocleid muscle, triangular shaped muscle. We should keep this、uh, sternocleid muscle intact. And after、uh, fully dissecting the sternocleid muscle, you can、uh, mobilize the splenius muscle. Uh, from the lateral to middle. So let's say sternocleid muscle needs to be go out and the、uh, splenius should be go medial. Then, after、uh, dissecting these two muscles, you will see the continu continuous occipital artery course from the distal part to the、uh, proximal part. 
occipital artery always go under to the longissimus muscle. Then once this small longissimus muscle has, has been uh, dissected the way, you can fully see the occipital artery course. Then uh, for the posterior circulation bypass or posterior circulation aneurysm, we do the full transcondylar approach. Then uh, dissect the uh, dura like this L-shaped. Now the distal point has been cut and ligate with 10% dense uh, heparinized saline. Then uh, for the posterior circulation lesions, I would say we can dissect the, uh, from the below, you can dissect the cerebral medullary fissure. Now I am mobilizing the horizontal fissure along the petrosal vein. So you should be able to see the middle cerebral peduncle easy. Now we see the Ica distal branch. Now we see the cochlear nerve, but she doesn't have any, uh, uh, he doesn't have the hearing already, so uh, we can retract more. Then uh, approximate to the occipital artery. We dissected the, I thought, of 15 centimeter. Then uh, do the fish mouse incision, then the ligate uh, with uh, 10 times dense heparinized saline. You can use the 27 gauge needle to make a an hole. Then after making the hole, you can uh, expand the window with a scissor. For the deeper part anastomosis, uh, for the initial stay suture, you should be very careful. You need to pay very best attention not to pull too much. For this patient, we did the running suture. So, but the uh, entry point, if the vessel wall uh, diameter is T, the uh, entry point should be 2T and the uh, uh, anastomosis interval should be 4T. Even for the landing suture, the basic principle should be the same. After uh, making the enough number of the landing suture, we need to tie up to the end. After completing the bypass, we trapped the aneurysm. With, uh, uh, for this patient, we use a slita clip. I, I, we identified the perforator from the ICA main trunk, but uh, this should be safe uh, with the bypass fold. Then uh, bypass has been uh, completed and the patent, and he doesn't have any worsening. We will finish, but for, for the last message, I will show the basics of the continuous anastomosis from the famous uh, cardiac surgeon uh, Atsushi Amano, is a Juntendo University professor before. Then uh, I had the privilege to uh, work with him because uh, he did the surgery in, in my previous hospital. Then he is saying, uh, it is most important to confirm the shape of the finished product. You have to imagine how the uh, uh, realized, how completed uh, an astomost vessel looks like. Then he, secondly, he is insisting insert the needle vertically to avoid the damaging or dissecting the intima from the vessel wall. Also, he's emphasized uh, it is important not to over tighten the sutures when ligating them. Uh, the, those three messages I can show, I can share with you. Now it's uh, close to the 30 minutes. I'd like to finish uh, for today's uh, lecture and I will take any comments or uh, questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nakatomi, for this uh, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, yes. one cases uh, and you gave us uh, many tips 
about uh, especially bypass surgery. Uh, yes. I think we can uh, open the discussion. Uh, so if there are questions from the audience. Yes, anything. We can go back to uh, the slide video. Yes. Yeah, I see Hello. Dr. Uh, Joe Sam. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Alberto Philippe. Yeah, Joe, uh, how are you? Hello, from Nagatomi. Nice to yeah. see you. See you and hear you our lecture you. again. Yeah, uh, I have one uh, question uh, yes. from today until today. Uh, for the real artery uh, to M2 uh, bypass, if yes. the inferior trunk is not suitable or um, for, for some reason, uh, can we use the superior trunk? And why is it that the inferior trunk would be more preferable? Thank you. Okay, let me go back to the video. The reason to choose the inferior trunk is the, uh, in general, the temporal inferior trunk supplies uh, only to the temporal lobe. But the uh, superior trunk, most of the time, supply to the motor area too. So uh, if you have some trouble to completing the anastomosis within 20 to 30 minutes, you have the high chance or high risk to uh, uh, encounter the ischemic uh, accident to the motor areas. So that is the number one reason. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ari Kiran. Yes. Uh, hi. Hello, Professor. Uh, yeah, hi. Good to see you again. Are you okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'm good. I had the honor to visit your cadaveric course last month. Yes, yes. It was very, very enlightening for us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have one question. So, uh, during the radial graft harvesting, how much length do you harvest the radial artery? And yeah. uh, what is the ideal length? And uh, so, can you just enlighten us on that? Yes, ideally, I recommend uh, 20, at least 20 centimeters, 20 then uh, as long as possible, you should take. Because I had the trouble uh, in one patient, we got the 18 centimeter uh, radiated graph. It didn't reach. So what I, I did, I, I, I talked with, uh, about this accident. I cut the uh, hypoglossal artery in the neck and uh, add the additional two to three centimeter to the radial artery graft, then anastomotic to the ECA. But it's very risky. So uh, I, my recommendation is please take as long as possible from the uh, wrist to the uh, elbows branching point, branching point to the ulnar artery. You should take uh, as long as possible. That's my... Uh, best recommendation. All of yes. you shouldn't encounter any graft shortage. That is catastrophic event in the operating room. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. If I may ask, Alberto. Yes, sir, Raja, please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nakatami, for enlightening us with such mesmerizing surgeries and Really appreciate your wonderful work. Uh, one question that I would like to clarify from you is that uh, you said in the first uh, paraclanoid surgery that you did intraoperative angiography, right? We did, yes. yes. So did you do it from the groin or the other side radial hand? And did you give uh, systemic heparinization after that? Uh, for the... Uh... Intraoperative angiography, we use the femoral areas. A routine uh, uh, femoral uh, areas uh, with the long catheter. And uh, after taking out, out the radial artery, uh, I have never used for the intraoperative angiogram, but uh, you might be able to. But uh, you know, 
uh, we have already taken out the part of the, of the uh, circle here. So you shouldn't use any, uh, you shouldn't uh, compromise at least ulna flow uh, because that is the only supply to the uh, palm. So I would say after can you, take, yeah. Can after you take, the other hand, other hand radial arteries then. There are yes. two hands. You can see uh, the opposite uh, uh, radius. Opposite hand. Opposite hand you can use. Yes. And did you give systemic heparinization? For the angiogram? Angiogram. Uh, actually, just for angiogram, we didn't. But uh, for the radial artery, we, we infused the 10 times uh, thick, dense heparinized serine to expand the radial artery diameter all the time. We washed all the time radial artery with 10 times heparin, a 10 times dense heparin. So these heparin can go into the systemic circulation all the time. I think uh, 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 naturally we used heparin uh, for this type of the procedures. Because I, we uh, expanded the uh, radial artery uh, fully, maximally with the heparinized saline infusion. At least I think we do uh, 10 to 20 times just before placing to the uh, anastomosis side. The pressure distension technique described Correct. by- yeah, Pressure distension Excellent. technique, yeah, we, we do it very seriously. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I see Dilshad. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for nice presentation. Yes. Uh, I have a interested in the the software you used uh, for the uh, uh, fusion of the uh, MRI and CT angiography. What kind yes. of software is that? Is you said that is available on commercial? Yes, actually, that is yes. For this type of the uh, uh, software, you can look at the grid. And the company should be the Compass. Can you see what we should send to chat? The company's name is Compass. Compass, okay. Yes, and the software name is uh, Grid, G-R-I-D. Grid. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah, thank you. Yes. And uh, some technical uh, information, which are very useful, actually. Um, I see there is also uh, Atik Islam, uh, who has a question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, yeah. Professor. Uh, can you recognize me? Well, we had a extraordinary time with you in uh, Tokyo last week, Cadaver workshop. Yeah, from yes. yeah. Oh. yeah, I'm from Bangladesh. One very yeah. simple question. Uh, yes. During do, doing high flow bypass, you always mm. do uh, STA M4 bypass always or sometimes? Actually, we do all the time uh, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, routine STMC should be the nice opportunity to do the uh, to let the young neurosurgeon to complete the bypass uh, because yeah. it's getting, it's easier than the M2 bypass and uh, you know uh, once we completed the STMC <clears throat> number one for the preventing ischemia while you are crying <clears throat> the number two you can use the brain surface pressure monitoring all the time while you clamp the ICA at the okay. end. At least you need to keep the stamp pressure, brain surface circulating pressure uh, more than 80% before and after the ICA clamping. We have yeah. some paper uh, from the uh, northern part of Japan. Uh, they, they reported uh, Eight percent of ischemic accident has uh, occurred once the eighty percent, the circulating pressure went below the eighty percent. 
Okay, so thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you very much. In the real yeah, world, uh, you can okay. you can skip. <laughs> but for the safe side, I think we should. It's better to put a assurance bypass, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Professor Nakatomi, I see you have many, many fellows uh, who attended your uh, cadaveric course today. Yeah, yeah, thank you for listening, coming. Which is very, very good. Uh, I see Ben also raised his hand. Please, Ben. Yes. Yes, hello. Hello, uh, Professor Nakatomi. Nice to meet you. I'm back from Hong Kong. So I really enjoy your lectures uh, very much. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, may I ask about, I saw that you use the uh, intraoperative uh, angiogram to, uh, to uh, look at the flow of the vessel. How about, uh, do you think there is a role of using a flow meter uh, at the same time uh, uh, during your uh, bypass surgery? And my second question is about, uh, what about the uh, postoperative uh, follow-up uh, investigation? Uh, what would uh, do, what would you suggest uh, to study? Seven without X twenty seven. Without X twenty seven. Uh, issue. Can you mute your mic? So let me. Uh, ha, what is the first uh, instrument? I, I couldn't catch the word. First one. What is uh, the first? Using the uh, chromometer. Chromometer. Yes. Using issue. the chromometer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The carbon. So, uh, what yes, yes, I think you are, you are quite right. Uh, so what do you think about the role of the foam meter when, when you have the intraoperative? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, angiogram is, uh, you can look at the speed of the circulation, like a circulation time, that is one clue. If the bypass radial artery flow can go, go up, but very slowly, you should uh, worry about something is wrong. Some, some, uh, some bending or some uh, rotations. Uh, by intraoperative angio, you can see the circulation speed and the circulation time and the circulation circulated area. You need to see all the area of the NCA at least has to be supplied by the graph. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in addition to uh, uh, angiogram, we also use the uh, Doppler flow meter, ultrasound flow meter, mm -hmm. uh, just before uh, creating cramp of the MCA, M2 area, you can uh, measure the, what is the uh, original M2 inferior trunk flow first. Then after completing the anastomosis, you, sh you, need, you can or you need to confirm at least before open up the graph, the M2 inferior trunk uh, Doppler flow meter should be near or similar. If you uh, see the uh, M2 trunk, M2 inferior trunk flow meter showed very, very decreased flow value, you have to suspect something squeezed something squeezed at the area of the anastomosis or some thrombosis might start to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, Doppler flow meter give you uh, everything is okay uh, just by the anastomosis procedures. For the second question, what, what's that? Yes, uh, for the second question, I would like to ask uh, in your opinion, uh, what uh, modality of investigation you will perform uh, to study the hemodynamics of your bypass after the operation during the follow-up period of your patient? During the follow-up period for this uh, supratentorial ECM2 bypass, uh, the mm -hmm. patient didn't die yet. Mortality? No, zero. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, what investigation you would use to study the hemodynamics of your bypass? Hemodynamics, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, for no the, uh, yeah, yeah. You can uh, use, according to your institutional devices, you can use 
for example, number one, a uh, dynamic CT scan, you can at least see mm -hmm. there is no difference between the contralateral or ipsilateral uh, cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume. Uh, by the dynamic CT scan, you can see the mean transitional time or uh, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, or I mean, uh, there are at least four parameters. By combining these four parameters, you should be able to differentiate the flow is enough, or flow is now a little bit uh, too much, or you, you can figure out what is going on, even with the dynamic CT scan. But ultimately, uh, mm -hmm. We will recommend the uh, nuclear medicine spec, like a uh, uh, EC, ECD spec or IMP spec. That is a real flow measurement. Or well, recently, yes, by so fMRI scan, yeah, you will have the uh, new technique for measuring the CBF, like uh, AC, ACD scan, or some. You, we have some new technique by the MRI to measure the uh, uh, simplified cerebral blood flow. ASL, uh, yeah. ASL image you can use too. Thank you, Professor Nakatomi. Uh, you. May I ask you uh, a question about the first question by Ben? You, you mentioned that if uh, the flow meter shows uh, there is an impairment in the flow after bypass, uh, you have to suspect, suspect uh, either thrombosis or uh, something wrong with the bypass. At that point, what do you do actually during the surgery? Do you reopen yes. the bypass? What do you yes. do? Uh, for example, if you are looking at the anastomotic site here, then there is a donor, donor is covering right here, okay? So this side is the distal end and uh, this side is the proximal end. If you see enough uh, flow at the proximal, but you didn't see anything on the distal end, uh, that is catastrophe. So uh, first thing I do, the bolus heparin 5,000 unit IV. Try uh, bolus heparin 5,000 first. Then uh, sometimes these tiny, tiny fast thrombos can go away. Right, so we can wait next uh, five minutes or so, how the thrombus can go or disappear. Or if you cannot see anything, any change, uh, you, you have to cramp and uh, look at the inside and uh, irrigate with the uh, real non-diluted heparin to uh, eliminate any uh, intimal uh, injury or any uh, thrombotic material uh, within the anastomotic segment. But That's after true. several trials of the, uh, uh, these deconstruction of the bypass, if you cannot see any improvement, you have to change the anastomotic site to the better place. That is catastrophe, but you shouldn't leave it. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Dr. Joe, uh, raise this hand again. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I have another burning question uh, from my yes. Uh Usually radial artery is the preferred uh, graph uh, for high flow bypass. Uh, would you do anything different if uh, you use a saphenous vein graph uh, in high flow bypass? Any tips or any difference uh, from a radial artery graph? Thank you. Yes. Uh, First of all, for the saphenous vein, because they have a lot of the bulb in, within inside. So uh, you have to be careful uh, the direction of the graft. Graft needs to be placed from the distal to the proximal. And unless you uh, keep this rule, you will, uh, your graft will occlude. The pain graft has a lot of the bulb. They are uh, preventing the backflow, like uh, pain can only uh, allow the flow from the distal to the central, from the yes. foot to uh, heart. 
So you have to keep in mind all the time. If you made a mistake that direction, you will have the catastrophe, okay? Also, the, uh, the Bain graph has a lot of the redundancy. They are so uh, soft, softener than radial artery. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can easily have the bending or twisting than the radial artery, even with the uh, serious many times with, with the pressure distension technique. Bain graft has a larger caliber and they could have some compression under the zygomatic arch, or they we will have a several uh, higher chance of the twist. Uh, so we have to be careful. Direction and the twisting. All right, Th thank you so much, Prof. Nakatomi. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Nakatomi. Um, Dr. Karimov. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Nakatomi, and uh, your lecture was very great, uh, very very perfect. And I was uh, I was interested in uh, high flow bypass, and the, every time we when we do high flow bypass, we uh, we uh, sew a radial artery to superior branch of M2, right? So uh, uh, inferior uh, uh, inferior trunk of M2. Ah, uh, inferior trunk. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Is it better to, yeah, it's better, I mean, it's best option, right, uh, to sew it to inferior trunk? Yes, uh, right. I, uh, let me just show again. Let's look at the Serbian fissure. We, we see the M1 segment here, that, that is a superior trunk, and this is a temporal uh, inferior trunk, okay? This is uh, on the right side. We cannot uh, see the screen. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't, sorry. Can you see okay? Yes. So we okay. are dissecting the right side of the Caribbean fissure. You see the uh, M2 branching point here. This is an inferior trunk. And this part should be the superior trunk. We saw a long perforating vessel here. Then I choose the anastomosis here. If you choose a superior trunk for the uh, bigger bypass, you will temporarily compromise the flow to the frontal lobe, particularly to the motor areas. So you, if your occlusion time exceeds 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you might have the risk to have the encounter the ischemia on the motor cortex. So that's uh, we need to avoid at any cost. So. Uh, for the first uh, attempt, you should try the temporal. But actually I did before, uh, I, I, I have several experience to anastomosis to the M1 and uh, the occlusion time has been 16 minutes, but I, I had a small five millimeter ischemia. I, I did everything, uh, 16 minutes occlusion time with uh, brain protection, elevated blood pressure, and uh, uh, actually I used the aspirin too, but I, I did have the small eight millimeter LSA ischemia, which has been uh, asymptomatic, unfortunately. But uh, after that case, I always avoid <laughs> to uh, uh, use a superior trunk. Are we okay? Thank you, Professor Nakatomi. Yes. Uh, okay, I think uh, uh, we had a very nice discussion today uh, after your uh, inspiring uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Nakatomi. Uh, I think we should go ahead with the next speaker. Uh, Alberto? Yes. I have uh, 
a small uh, comment, not comment, but uh, invitation to Professor uh, Nakatomi. Um, yes, please, please maybe go he ahead. Was, he is not aware of that uh, we are holding a, a Central Asian Congress in um, in our country, Uzbekistan, Tashkent. Uh, yes. So it is going to be conjoined with uh, Asian Congre Congress of Neurosurgeons and uh, International uh, Minimal Invasive uh, Neurosurgery Society, uh, Seventh Congress. Uh, so uh, we are holding this Congress on um, 15, 16, 17th of September uh, this year. So you are most welcome to come our Congress and we'll, we will be just happy to uh, sharing your experience with our Central Asian, all neurosurgeons. Actually, it's International Congress, so many um, attendants, attendees are will be waited there. Okay, that's a very kind invitation. Thank you very, 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 very much. I, I really appreciate it. I have to look into my schedule, but, but uh, I, I hope if it, it's available, my schedule is available. But at least uh, I can uh, join some some sort of the webinar. Uh, at least I can promise. Uh, just okay. webinar, so, yeah. Think. As you mentioned, it is uh, so uh, the Congress is hybrid format. Uh, you will try your best if you can in person uh, participate. Then yeah. we, as as Plan B, we can choose a webinar format. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Great. Great. Gozaimasu. Thank you, thank you for this very good idea uh, and thank you again Professor Nakatomi uh, for uh, this uh, very active discussion uh, and now we can move on to the next speaker. I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Ishu Bishnoi to help me introducing our next speaker. Unmute, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Heba Mohammad Azuz. She is a leading woman neurosurgeon from Cairo, Egypt. She has done her neurosurgery from Cairo University. She is currently practicing as neurosurgery assistant lecturer and working on her PhD degree. She has attended various courses on neurosurgery, skull base, endoscopy, microscopy. And today she will be speaking on updates in microvascular decompression technical note. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Heba to present his le lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Professor Nakatomi Sensei for this um, impressive talk. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, I just want to share my screen. Is it uh, visible at the moment? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, I think I, I sent it to you also on, on the email, just in case. If, um... There is option of sharing. Yeah, I, I use. The... Did you did you share uh, all the screen or just a specific window? Maybe sometimes. Uh, if you... yeah. Sorry. If you Let's if you again. have the desktop, so is it visible in the moment also? Yes. Yeah, transposition of whatever artery. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So we have a uh, wonderful, like to... a wonderful look on the pyramids. Yeah. yeah. So the temptation for uh, for you to come to Egypt. Absolutely. Um, so I have a small presentation about technical notes in hemifacial spasm, which I basically learned in my fellowship at Vegeta University Hospital under supervision of Professor Yoku and uh, Professor Komatsu Sensei, uh, who also taught me a lot about it. So I owe him most of this presentation. So to start, uh, of course, I'm just gonna go through a quick introduction about hemifacial spasm. Uh, most of us know it starts from uh, orbicularis oculi to orbicularis oris, 
this is the typical one. Sometimes it's atypical. And the reason between the two directions is the reason of the uh, nerve compression. Mostly it's from the axilla, from down. That's why the ticks or the convulsion starts up, goes down. If the compression is superior, then the convulsion starts from down up, which is atypical of inflation spasm. As we know all from the anatomy, this is the, the vasculature in the brainstem. The most common compression is ICA, which is 43 percentage. Pica comes second. Uh, vertebral artery, it states in, a, in some of the documents it's 23, but actually they state other than Ica count, Pica counts as 23%. So the existence of vertebral artery is a bit uh, narrow in the, in the research. It's not rare, but it's very narrow. So the other thing is about the compression side of the nerve. Uh, the history in compression is the Radlich zone which is transition zone between the central and peripheral uh, neurulation of the nerve. But this is actually a very old school because we found that the, this zone actually only counts for 23% of the compression. The compression of the nerve, as you can see in the, in the screen, you have the root exit zone, uh, attached segment, and the root detachment part, and then the cisternal part. The root exit zone and the attached segment count for 73%. So it's, it's more compression side than the transition zone that we all know through uh, previous literature in the hemifacial spasm. Uh, the type of vascular compression um, it could be just uh, touching, uh, contact or compression, or sometimes it's uh, identation in the nerve. And the effect of uh, compression is related to a lot of things. The history and the long uh, period of uh, manifestation uh, and symptoms it counts as a, as a number one factor. Also, the caliber of the vessel, if it's a huge vessel or it's a vein uh, that compresses it. About the proximity, uh, some, some authors actually uh, find it's, uh, it doesn't really touch the nerve, even though the pulsatile movement of the vessel affects the nerve through the arachnoids. So sometimes the compression from a vessel could be a neighboring vessel, uh, we cannot find an exact contact between the vessel and the nerve, but this is, can be contributed to the arachnoid, which transmit the pulse style uh, movement of the vessel, and hence it causes the aphatic stimulation of the nerve, which causes either a hemifacial spasm or neuralgia in different nerves. So, um, radiological examination, after, of course, Physical examination is very important. It gives you a lead about uh, whether there is uh, a primary or a secondary reason for the compression. Uh, it could be other than vessel, it could be a tumor or MS fake. It's not very common in the hemifacial spasm, uh, the MS. Uh, so MRI and the confusion of the vessel, uh, MRI, uh, 3D MRI also can give you an orientation about the vessel and the location. You can see here also the location of the vessel uh, affecting the exit zone of the nerve. Uh, as we can go through the operative details, uh, most of the surgeon choose an asterisk point as a landmark. Uh, few surgeons choose a very uh, narrow uh, craniotomy. Uh, Others choose a huge craniotomy according to the tools they're using, whether it's microscopic or endoscopic. The endoscopic part actually aids in decreasing the amount of the craniotomy in the bony work. Uh, also, you don't have to go up until you find the sinus and the, the conjunction of the sinuses. Uh, you don't need this much of uh, space. So tailoring it could avoid any venous injury. So this, this can help you in pre-planning. Of course, the patient stays in a park bench position. Also, the use of endoscope doesn't really need the huge uh, rotation of the patient. Uh, just a simple uh, lateral position can actually help. Uh, the most important thing between choosing the approach and choosing the tools is how, how you can master them. So if you're mastering the microscopic technique, there, there is no need to go for endoscopic technique. If you're mastering the endoscopic technique, then you, you can use it. So you have to remember again and again that microscope, endoscope are, are a tool to help you achieve your goals and not the exact goal. Uh, so going through the anatomy of this area, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows about it. Uh, but I'm, I'm referring to this anatomy for a few, few things. Uh, first of all, when you do the durotomy, this is the field that you would have to see. So the arrangement of the nerves uh, is as follows, uh, five. 
which are geminal nerve and then uh, seven and eight complex and then the lower cranial nerves. Uh, but the thing about the trigeminal nerve is a little bit uh, in front or anterior. So you always find it a little bit deeper than the seven and eight complex. Also seven and eight complex, you could see it entering uh, uh, to the um, turn out the canal. Uh, there is the tubing in line, uh, which shows the internal district canal. So it can help you if you're going up, you can look down. So the use of endoscope doesn't need a huge um, Gyrotomy or a craniotomy, hence you can always use an angled endoscope. But just to remark that the trigeminal nerve is a little bit deeper than the 7 8 complex. Uh, to achieve this kind of view in the surgery, the, the best part to do, regardless of your craniotomy or the bony work or the gyrotomy, is actually the arachnoid dissection, um, which is, uh, in my opinion, is one of the most important points in microvascular decompression, regardless of the pathology or regardless of the technique you use. Because arachnoid dissection is proper and you take your time in the arachnoid dissection, it avoids the retraction of the cerebellum and hence retraction of small blood vessels that you might not see. Because one of the things, a uh, small blood vessel, uh, which is a tiny vessel, the labyrinthine artery, uh, that you might not see, but a uh, small injury to it can cause deafness straight ahead. So, and a lot of other, of course, uh, vessels and, and veins and controls of veins. So the more arachnoid dissection, the more time you give for arachnoid dissection, the easier the, the manipulation of the cerebellum, the easier the manipulation of the vessels. So uh, in, in the technical notes, we use two angled uh, endoscope, the zero angle and the 30 degree angle. Uh, in the Fujita, they have the pneumatic uh, compression uh, holder of the endoscope, which make it easier to use two hands in the surgery. And this is a, a picture to show also the difference between a zero and a 30 degree angle. So this is the exact part. Uh, left side is the zero angled endoscope and then 30 degree angled endoscope. It gives you a better vision of the axilla of the nerve, uh, of the vessel, of any loops that you cannot miss. Uh, and also it gives you uh, and inside maybe there is a vein or a vessel adjacent to the compression, it could be a double compression. So the more, the more better visualization you have, uh, the better the outcome, in my opinion. So microvascular decompression technique, uh, the most common one is the interposition, uh, inserting a teflon a pad between the vessel and the nerve, uh, which is, we cannot be against it. It's the, 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 the most common way of uh, microvascular decompression in literature. But uh, teflon also is associated with a lot of uh, complication. Uh, because it, it later on, you can see it in the recurrent case, a lot of amalgamated vessels and nerves are attached to the Teflon pad. Uh, some inflammation and granuloma formation happens around the Teflon pad. So it's not that we cannot uh, say the Teflon pad uh, is obsolete, but uh, if you can not use it and have a different opinion or different approaches, then that's why this uh, session is about. Other thing is this link. Um, the sling is basically, as you can see, it's a, like an aneurysm clip, small one. You can hang the vessel and attach to the dura, or you can at hang the vessel around with a Teflon pad and attach the aneurysm to the Teflon pad to the dura, regardless of the, of the technique. So it's, this also carry the um, complication of uh, compression with the aneurysm clip sometimes. Uh, but there's a lot, not a lot of cases uh, using this way. Some, some literature, some papers are about it, but not a lot of it. So we cannot say it has a rate, a fixed rate of complication, but it's an alternative. The other one is, uh, the last one is transposition. Transpositioning is basically uh, after, again, proper dissection of the arachnoid, you can manipulate the vessel, regardless of the vessel you want, and attach it to the dura, which is maybe the petrous or the tensorial surface according to the location uh, of the decompression and according to the loop of the vessel that you, you can uh, manipulate it. Uh, the thing is about uh, transposition, um, one thing is using fiber glue for the blood vessel to attach to the dura, you have to use a, a dry fuel. So you need to wait uh, for a few moments for the CSF to drain and relaxation of the, uh, the cerebellum for the fibrin glue actually to uh, attach to the dura. So fibrin glue has been uh, on a lot of researches in uh, 
Jenner surgery and in uh, preferners and in vascular surgery. And it chose to have um, a good outcome in the strength of the pool. Uh, some paper actually uh, nerve graft, they've seen that the fiber glue is better than stitching and it's as strong as a silk stitches. Uh, although the fiber glue has its own complication of its uh, bovine uh, background or origin, so it might harbor um, infection, uh, which isn't common. It's uh, maybe about 2% or something. It's, it's not very common, but it still ha ha holds the option of uh, transmitting infection due to the origin of fiber glue. So this is like a quick scheme of the using of transposition. So after uh, you can find superior cerebellar artery and then arachnoid dissection and moving the vessel away and then using a Teflon pad to attach it to the dura. Because sometimes the, the CP angle region is very narrow. Sometimes it could be wide enough for you to manipulate. Sometimes the vessels are very rigid to manipulate or you don't have enough space to manipulate the river. So it comes on. And it's not an alternative, but more of a modification to the transposition with a grid line scheme. So you can use a Teflon pad attached to the vessel and then attached to the dura. Uh, it has like four types. It's a single piece of Teflon. You could add it a small, very small one to the vessel and then attach it to the dura. Or you can make uh, multiple pieces of Teflon and attach them to the dura to have a more horizontal uh, force attached to the dura. It gives it, gives it more strength. Uh, maybe used in a, a bigger caliber vessels. And uh, number C is, as you can see, the stacks of piles. So sometimes you cannot raise the vessel uh, up high to the dura, and you don't have the space and the capacity to do this. So the bread line technique, which is a Teflon pad over the other, can help you do this. Uh, the last one is adhering the Teflon pad of the offending vessel to another vessel. So just to move uh, the offending vessel out of the compression segment or the compression zone on the move. So uh, this is a video, but I don't think it's, it's working, unfortunately. So I'll try to explain it in pictures. So this is the craniotomy that uh, Komatsu Sensei used in the endoscopic uh, microvascular decompression. Uh, as you can see, the bony work is around one and a half centimeters only. So it's a very minimal invasive surgery. Uh, of course, as we mentioned earlier, you have to identify radiologically uh, the offending vessel. It helps you to give you an input. Sometimes intraoperative, you don't find any offending vessel. And this again uh, could be solved with a proper arachnoid dissection because some of the pulsatile movement of the vessel, which causes the aphatic stimulation of the nerve is transmitted only through the arachnoid uh, trabeculations. Uh, so pictures of the VG that I couldn't share, it's the, the one on the left is zero degree endoscope. Uh, as you can see the lower cranial nerves and eight nerve, you cannot see properly. You could just see the uh, top of it. You cannot see a uh, facial nerve and definitely you cannot see the axilla. But once we switch to the 30 degree after arachnoid dissection, now we can see the two vertebral artery and the anterior spinal artery. And you can see facial and cochlear nerve. And you can see in the depth, as you mentioned earlier, the trigeminal nerve. Um, this is after 30 degree. Then after arachnoid dissection of the vertebral artery, you can move it. The vertebral artery is a very big caliber artery vessel. Sometimes it's very hard to manipulate. Um, it's mostly common also on the left side because of the origin of the left vertebral artery directly from the subclavian artery. So the velocity and the amplitude in the vessel is, is higher than the right one. So that's why it's more associated with uh, hemophilia spasm than the right one. Anyway, so in the picture on the left, we could see the fibrin glue uh, injected uh, to attach the vertebral artery to the tent, uh, to the dura segment. And as we mentioned, it has to be a little bit dry so for the fiber glue to fixate the vessel into the dura. And then after fixating it, you wait for a while and check, check, check the, the pulsation of the vertebral artery and that's holding place. Uh, also, um, some of the good techniques that you could use is uh, injection of um, uh, like a dye, whatever 
wherever you are, you can use it. So you can see if there is another loop of the vessel around the nerve that you cannot see. And also you can see and make sure of the integrity of the artery after the transposition, transfixating it, this, there's no any compression. Of course, you could see with the naked eye at the vessel itself, uh, there's no any contracture in it, which is not very uncommon. Uh, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heva, for the wonderful video. So we we have our first question uh, from Dr. Harshad Parikh. Uh, he is asking, uh, was there any post-op nerve paralysis? Sorry, was what? Uh, is there any post-op nerve weakness? Uh, uh, I didn't see any complications so far with working with Kanatsu Sensei. Thank you. That's it. So the um, it is open for the discussions. Uh, Alberto, please. Yes, thank you, Ishu. Uh, thank you, Heba, for uh, this uh, wonderful presentation. Very interesting. Uh, as you know, I, I like endoscopy very much, so I was particularly attracted by this presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is uh, I noticed that you are using a two-hand technique with uh, holding uh, instruments. So uh, do you have an assistant who is uh, holding the endoscope while you are uh, maneuvering uh, the vessels? This is my first question. And the second question is how much uh, do you rely on uh, fibering glue? over time. Uh, I don't know how long uh, your follow-up for these patients is, uh, but I would be, I would like to, to know a uh, longer follow-up if you have uh, uh, any relapse of, uh, of the syndrome. Uh, okay, first, first question. Uh, most of those cases that I've learned, are, I've learned at the GT University, I've uh, under the operate, operators, uh, Dr. Kamatsu Sensei, and he's the one operating it. So yeah, he used both hands and there is the pneumatic fixator and uh, endoscopic holder oh, uh, that he used, so he used it. In Egypt, uh, we also have a fixed endoscope holder, so we can use it, but in CP anger uh, uh, region, uh, I don't recommend it uh, to fixate it, especially in uh, microvascular decompression because you don't need a lot of movement uh, and it's a short time procedure. So to avoid uh, sometimes the, the fixated uh, endoscopic holder, the minute you try to unlock it, unlock it itself cause a slight movement in a very tight compartment. So it's according to the surgeon practice. Uh, the second question about the follow-up, this is a very important question and a very important landmark in this uh, technique. It's uh, so far it's going great. But to actually accomplish uh, results in microvascular decompression, you need at least one year to five years to, to see the recurrence of symptoms. So we didn't go this far yet for the outcome. Thank you. Yes, it will be very interesting to know uh, in a few years uh, uh, so, how yeah. there are patients uh, having the same problem uh, as before. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? I think yes. Hi, you good to see you. <laughs> How are you? Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to ask uh, regarding your position for uh, these MBD cases. Uh, would you prefer them? to be in the park bench position or uh, or do you do it in the supine position with a lot of tilt uh, and do, any advantages or disadvantages in, in your opinion, in your practice? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question and nice to see you again. Uh, I think the supine position with a too much lateral uh, side, it's, it's not the best uh, position for most of surgeries because uh, you compress the neck mates and most of the patients actually uh, later on, they have a uh, neck spasm and they spend like a uh, head tilted for a week or something, which is very painful. So if you can just use a lateral position or a part bench position, so that would be better. Uh, in microscope, you would need to go the full range of lateral part bench position uh, to, uh, to have a clear vision and because you don't want to uh, hurt your neck as well. And in the scope, it, the angulation can be a little bit less 
because uh, 30 degrees is co uh, cover up for this space. Okay. Not the answer this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hari Kiran. Uh, hello. Hi, Dr. Eva. Very excellent presentation and uh, very interesting to see the new approach. Never seen the fibrin transposition before. We always use the slim technique, which is more common, I believe. So my question is, when you have applied the fibrin glue, so I believe, I think there is no CSF. So once the CSF starts flowing, so how, how much to rely on the fibrin glue? I think it can dissolve uh, after some time due to the CSF flow. So uh, okay. uh, uh, how to rely on the fibrin glue completely? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that the answer of this question is, uh, again, the long-term follow-up. So that's why we need the long-term follow-up, uh, especially in large caliber arteries and vessels like the vertebral artery. Uh, to assess the integrity and the holding of the fibrin glue. Fibrin glue has, has been used and there is a lot of papers about fibrin glue in uh, vascular surgery uh, and in nerve grafts. And it shows to have a very high integrity and high pull-up strength uh, of the fibrin glue. So uh, compared to the strength, it's good, it's okay. Uh, compared, okay. Mentioning the idea of CSF affecting it on the long term, this is what we should be seeing in a long term follow up. Plan. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, instead of Komatsu Sensei, uh, maybe the, just we started the last three years. So at least three years, we can uh, ensure, I think. And it, it's very simple. And also, that we can uh, uh, add heat a bit longer, the longer, longer part the vessels. Uh, how, how do you think, uh, Nakatomi-sensei, uh, how do you detach the, the vessel, some uh, incision or uh, transposition? Uh, in Japanese, uh, many surgeons are using the, the thread, thread technique to uh, make the uh, uh, teflon as a string, like a thread material. And, uh, uh, rotate the vessel like, like this way, then uh, the tip and the end of the thread should be the attached to the uh, petrosal ruler. And that is another option. And uh, I think uh, for the last question, how, how long we need to be certain the CSS won't touch the uh, fibering group. We, we should, if you use a uh, 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 company uh, commercially available uh, bioactive material, I think you you have to keep dry at least five minutes. If you are uh, sure uh, you have been keep in dry at least five minutes, that adhesion is very firm and strong. Uh, because I have encountered the uh, uh, Lee operation after the wrapping, the, uh, even with the uh, bioactive material, they are very firm, uh, firmly stick to the aneurysm. So uh, I would say, as far as you are uh, sure about at least five to 10 minutes, you have been keep them dry, that should be okay. Uh, from, from the reoperation experience. <laughs> Thank you. And did you use a reoperation in uh, microvascular decompression? Uh, actually, uh, for, for the aneurysm, but uh, well, so this uh, wrapping material has been stick, very stickly attached to the vessel. Perfect. So I'm assuming this uh, uh, bioactive mater material can stick very strongly. Thank you so you, much. You, yeah, you have to avoid the very immediate uh, separation from the dura, but uh, mm -hmm. you are certain at least 10 minutes, that should be okay. I got it. Thank you. It's a good uh, suggestion, actually. And in any case, Heba, you should consider yourself invited again in three years to show us yeah. your follow-up results. Yeah. The, the, uh, the whole credit goes to Kumatsu Sensei. Yeah. Of course, of course. And Professor Yokokato, of course. I think we can invite you both <laughs> to show follow-up results. It will be very interesting to know. I see uh, Professor Pirzad uh, raised his hand. 
professor Pistad. Yes. Uh, uh, hello. Hello. Salam alaikum. Kurishiva. Salam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heba. Very nice presentation. Just I uh, like to know your uh, advice about uh, continuing uh, medicine uh, after surgery uh, or not. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question quite well. Yes, uh, are you continuing uh, uh, anti-spasmodic uh, medication after surgery or not? Um, I, I, I didn't see someone using it, and I don't think I see you, uh, there's, if there's no a, a lot of manipulation in the vessel, then you don't need it. OK, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Abida. Hello, Professor Carto. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I think the main uh, hi Hiba, thanks for a very beautiful presentation. I think the main technique that she's already been emphasizing is the arachnoid dissection. Is once you have done the arachnoid dissection and separated the vessel, that is half your work is done. And with that arachnoid dissection, the vessel remains quite separate from the you know conflict. The vertebral is quite a large vessel, so you know you have to separate it quite extensively along the whole path to keep it separate. I was just wondering if you have to operate this patient for some other reason, then what you will see? I don't know. Maybe we'll find out in the long term follow up. You know, not maybe for the you know microvascular, but just for some other reason. And uh, interestingly, vertebral artery can cause compression syndromes even in the spine. So I have seen one patient where both the vertebral arteries were compressing the C2 region and causing cervical myelopathy. So we used a Teflon to the dura and kept it separate. So no. vertebral artery can cause a lot of compression syndromes. Thank you again for a good presentation, Eva. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the commissioner say, do you have such experience that compressive the pain and the compressive vessel is a very big one? Do you have such experience? Uh, for the healthier patient, uh, uh, you know, the most of the patients for my practice has been already uh, have the big compression from the <laughs> vertebral artery. So, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't say uh, uh, just my repasy has studied or they, they showed a lot of the symptoms. So the, the, the just the uh, myelopathy sign from the VA compression is very unique. I, I haven't experienced. Thank you much. We've, we've published this. It is actually bilateral vascular pectexy of the vertebral arteries in a, for a case of vertebral, you know, cervical myelopathy. I think it was the, I think there are some eight or nine cases probably reported. I don't remember now. It was some seven, eight years back. So it was like a dolico tactic. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were like both the vessels were coming right across and sitting on the C2 region, and then right. we just kind of opened it up. Right. Yeah. Dolico ectatic lesion is a Nagatomi sensei is a specialist to treat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very nice. So today we had a very uh, good uh, overview over this kind of uh, pathologies based on vessels. So. Thanks to both of our uh, speakers. Uh, issue, do we have other uh, questions? No, I don't think so. So any comments or any questions, they are most welcome. Yes, otherwise uh, probably we can uh, uh, conclude. Uh, maybe uh, before closing this webinar, we can have uh, some closing remarks uh, from Professor Yoko Kato. Thank you very much. So the Nakatomi Sensei, thank you very much for uh, even a very, very hectic time. So he must be very busy uh, now, I think. So, but the, even though that you should come to the Central Asia, please. So Tashkent, uh, how many hours from uh, from Japan, uh, deal shot? I think may maybe through Korea, uh, the two hours to, to Korea and uh, from Korea to Tashkent, seven hours, I think. How do you think, please? <laughs> Keep your calendar. All right. Uh, Hiba Sensei, thank you very much. All right, please.
all the rest in your future. Are you in the Cairo now? Yeah, I'm in Children's Cancer Hospital now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, Pisa, thank, thank you very much. Abhinashya, thank you so much. So, everyone, thank you very much. So, that's Thank you, Professor Thank you. Castro. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can. Uh, I think we can close uh, this uh, very nice webinar today. Uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, Professor uh, uh, Hirofumi Nakatomi and Dr. Heba Azuz for uh, wonderful talks. Uh, thank you to uh, Ishu Bishnoi, my uh, co-moderator, uh, Professor Yoko Kato, and all the friends and colleagues who joined and. Uh, uh, allowed a very, very active discussion. Thank you to all of you and see you next time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.